to allow all of us to turn on our videos. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to today's MetroVision Idea Exchange. The topic is setting limits on new parking to achieve community goals. Um, I'm just gonna confirm that everyone can hear me okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay, um, just a quick note that this idea exchange will be recorded. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in since we've got a fairly full agenda this morning. So a quick plug for MetroVision. Uh, MetroVision is the shared guiding vision of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and a set of outcomes, objectives, and voluntary initiatives for many partners to consider. Implementation of MetroVision is dependent on many partners uh, contributing through different pathways and at different speeds. Idea exchanges are opportunities to highlight how partners around the region are contributing to the implementation of Metro Vision. So a quick overview of today's uh, idea exchange. We'll have a couple of quick announcements We'll have Dr. Cog's staff speak to the Dr. Cog uh, Transportation Demand Management Plan uh, and the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Mitigation Action Plan, looking at greenhouse gas. Uh, we'll have a quick topic framing and an introduction of the panelists. Um, and then we'll have panelist presentations. We've got speakers coming from the city of Littleton, city of Longmont, and city of Boulder. And then we'll have a moderated panelist discussion hosted by Mallory Baker, Senior Consultant with Walker Consultants, and then we'll have time for audience question and answers. You'll notice through the Zoom function, there's a Q&A chat box. Please feel free to add any questions or comments in the Q&A function. And when we get to the audience Q&A portion of this idea exchange, we'll make sure to, to ask as many of the questions as we have time for. Um, so one of the first announcements we have today is the upcoming MetroVision Awards, the, or sorry, Dr. Cog Awards. MetroVision Awards recognize excellence, innovation, collaboration, and leadership in problem solving among communities and their partners. The realization of Denver Region's shared vision is through programs, projects, and plans that bring businesses, elected officials, community advocates, and residents together to accomplish more than any one partner could achieve alone. The John V. Christensen Memorial Award has been presented since 1973 as one of the region's most prestigious awards. It recognizes individuals who promote cooperation and collaboration for the benefit of the region. Each year, way to go recognizes commuters and employers in the Denver region who choose commute options that reduce traffic congestion to improve air quality. You can submit a nomination for an employer champion, a rising star, or commuter of the year. You can submit nominations at drcog.org slash awards by Friday, April 14th. I've got video going. So, our second announcement is we've got Bike to Work Day. Uh, this year's theme is Joyride. The idea is that biking is an activity that should evoke joy. Also, because, also many of our region's employees have not returned to an office full-time. So this is trying to be inclusive of participants who may not have an office to ride to on the, the day of Bike to Work Day, which this year will be Wednesday, June 28th. Sorry, the slides are advancing a little slow for some reason this morning. There are three ways to support Bike to Work Day. Um, you can host a station, join the business challenge, or register to ride your, your bike in honor of Bike to Work Day on June 28th. Registration begins uh, for rider registration on April 17th. Uh, and the day is June 28th. You can do station registration and business challenge registration currently. Business challenge registration closes on April 14th. For any additional questions on Bike to Work Day, you can 
please reach out to the Way to Go staff with Dr. Cog. So Dr. Cog does not necessarily manage parking in the region, but Dr. Cog has a regional interest in parking as it relates to our transportation planning work, specifically our transportation demand management planning work and our greenhouse gas mitigation action plan. Uh, here to speak a little bit more uh, about some of the work that uh, Dr. Cog is doing related to parking and transportation planning are Kaylee Fallon, who is the emerging, emerging uh, mobility uh, and uh, TDM planner with Dr. Cog. Uh, who will be speaking about the regional transportation demand management plan and then Jacob Rieger who is the multimodal transportation planning manager who will speak to the mitigation action plan. I'll turn it over to Kaylee. Thanks Dylan and good morning everyone. Um, like Dylan said my name is Kaylee Fallon. I am the emerging mobility and TDM planner with Dr. Cog. Just wanted to quickly introduce the Regional Transportation Demand Management Strategic Plan and kind of talk about how it fits into our broader conversation that we're having here today around parking management and setting parking maximums. So next slide, please. Perfect. Okay. So um, how does the TDM strategic plan fit into Dr. Cog's overarching Metro Vision plan, specifically the Regional Transportation Plan or RTP? Um, so the TDM strategic plan really hits on the RTP priorities of air quality, multimodal mobility, and active transportation. Um, I would also venture to say that the TDM strategic plan hits on the safety priority of the RTP as well. Um, so really supporting those uh, MetroVision priorities. And how we are going about developing the TDM strategic plan, um, the first step is really evaluating the existing TDM programs, practices, partnerships, and policies within the region. So what does the TDM landscape look like currently? And then through that and through, um, through that existing conditions, looking at um, engaging our stakeholder and partner agencies throughout the region um, to develop a regional TDM toolkit. Um, and that will look at areas of opportunity for TDM in the region um, and really through engaging um, our stakeholders, making sure that we are implementing equity in all of um, those TDM strategies that come out of the toolkit um, and making sure that we are um, putting equity in, in everything that we do um, for the plan. Um, and so really um, the key takeaway of the plan is how can Dr. Cog expand our definition of TDM in the region? So next slide, please. Um, so kind of our, our guiding star, if you will, um, is this notion that effective TDM requires the use of a suite of strategies. Um, so all the strategies you see here listed out, um, they're all connected and they all need to be used in order to um, have successful TDM in the region. Um, so that includes marketing, education, and outreach strategies. It also includes infrastructure, um, mobility services, parking, land use, and subsidies. And, and so for our conversation, here today, um, parking and land use will be kind of the two main strategies that we focus on. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so what does parking management in the uh, under the umbrella of a TDM strategy look like? Um, and so these are just um, some examples of what parking or, or what strategies fall under parking. Um, and really the key takeaway here is that free parking and abundant parking incentivizes those single occupancy vehicle trips, right? Um, if people know that they have a parking spot, if they know it's free, um, that encourages people to drive alone. And so um, a couple of parking strategies that helps incentivize people to um, take those alternative modes, take the transit trip, take the carpool, van pool, whatever it might be, um, include paid parking, unbundled parking, preferred and discounted parking for carpool and van pool, um, as well as shared parking. And so um, I also think that our conversation here today about um, parking maximums also kind of falls into that category of TDM parking management and land use strategies. So next slide, please. Um, and really just to wrap up, um, key takeaways, how do TDM and parking and land use, um, how do these all fit together? And, and really um, it's looking at 
successful TDM strategies must all work together in tandem. And, and when we see successful TDM in the region, um, we'll see that it really supports each Metro Vision theme and outcome. Um, and so as Dylan kind of spoke to earlier um, today, those outcomes include livable communities, healthy and active choices, a vibrant economy, um, speaking to the land use piece, that efficient compact urban development pattern, a connected multimodal region, and then um, lowering greenhouse gas emissions and, and clean air. Um, and and so I think this is a perfect segue to hand it over to Jacob Rieger, who will be talking about um, the 2050 Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan. Um, so thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, again, Jacob Rieger, Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Um, as Kaylee mentioned and Dylan mentioned, you know, parking is important to our work at Dr. Cog from several perspectives. Um, Kaylee just talked about our regional TDM strategic plan. I'm going to talk about parking from the perspective of our 2050 regional transportation plan and our greenhouse gas work that we did associated with that plan. Next slide, please. So just a little bit, it's, it's hard to talk about this without the context of what is the greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, I think many of you on this uh, call today have heard about it. Um, the greenhouse gas transportation planning standard was adopted back in December of 2021 by the uh, State Transportation Commission in Colorado. It applies to CDOT and it applies to the metropolitan planning organizations, which are the federally designated um, organizations of which there's five in the state, including Dr. Cog, who are responsible for leading multimodal transportation planning within their regions. The way the rule applies to us in simple terms is that our 2050 regional transportation plan needed to meet the rules emission reduction levels that were set, uh, numerical levels that were set in the rule region-wide for the Dr. Cog region for four analysis years. Um, between 2025 and 2050. And that updated plan had to be, and it was adopted by October 1st of last year per the requirements of the rule. Next slide, please. So um, part of our compliance strategy for the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan to meet the emission reduction levels that are required by the rule, we did several things within the plan. What I'm gonna to highlight today is one of those many strategies, which was something called the Mitigation Action Plan as provided for in the planning standard um, you can use a mitigation action plan as a last step to kind of close a remaining reduction level gap, which we did to meet those regional reduction levels. Um, mitigation measures in the mitigation action plan and the plan itself are measured regionally, but they're implemented locally across the region. Mitigation measures that are in the plan are voluntary, and they're not required to implement in any specific location or in any specific time frame. Because we don't need mitigation measures as part of our greenhouse gas compliance strategy until 2030, we've got some time between now and 2030 to kind of adjust, to start to implement these strategies and um, be flexible and adjust over time based on how that implementation progresses between now and 2030. However, we are required to do annual reporting on the progress of our implementation of the mitigation measures within the mitigation action plan. Next slide. And uh, realize that this slide needs some animation. If you could go ahead and just animate this through. Uh, what we're showing here, thank you very much, is the mitigation measures that are within the mitigation action plan. And there's several sort of mitigation measure strategies in the interest of time. I'm not going to go through all of them today, but they are all kind of local government oriented, policy oriented, qualitative things that local governments take the lead on, including, as I've highlighted, reducing or eliminate minimum parking requirements and set maximum requirements for parking. Um, so that was a key strategy in terms of one of our mitigation measures in the mitigation action plan. So I think the point from this perspective is that this is something that, again, while it's voluntary, is an important strategy that would be led by local governments. And as local governments in the region over time start to think about parking policy, to make changes to parking standards uh, within your local governments, and really thinking about strategies around reducing or eliminating minimum parking requirements or setting maximum levels, um, particularly in transit-focused areas or citywide, or however your particular parking ordinances are structured, we want to help you, we want to work with you, and frankly, we want to know about it um, because that's part of our work to kind of capture that activity as part of these mitigation measures for greenhouse gas compliance. Next slide. So just really briefly, um, don't want to go through math on a MetroVision ID exchange first thing in the morning, but just wanted to be transparent and kind of show um, sort of the math around um, our compliance with the greenhouse gas reduction levels. I'm not going to go through these numbers now, except to say that, again, these are regional targets for the Dr. Cog MPO area, um, the greater Denver metro area. Um, these are numerical million metric tons of greenhouse gas 
uh, reductions uh, levels that uh, we need to meet through our regional transportation plan for each of those analysis years. And it basically just shows how our work, including the mitigation action plan, helped us get there uh, to meet the reduction targets that were set and the reduction levels that were set in the greenhouse gas planning standard for this region. And thanks to the mitigation action plan, including parking strategies incorporated in the mitigation action plan, uh, we're able to meet those um, forecasted, able to meet those reduction standards uh, for the greenhouse gas work. So next slide, which I think that was my last slide. So with that, I will turn it back to Dylan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. So from here, I will actually turn it over to Mallory Baker. Mallory is a senior consultant with the Walker Consultants working locally in the region. And Mallory will introduce the topic for us today. Great, thanks Dylan. And I'm glad we were able to get <laughs> the videos to work. Um, so I wanna commend Dr. Cog on a very um, apt timing of this conversation. 2023 is actually the 100th anniversary of um, the, the first parking requirement, which is established in 1923 in Columbus, Ohio. So um, I think this is a really exciting time to have this conversation. We know that this conversation has become increasingly rigorous. Um, municipalities and other public agencies have recognized that parking requirements are not mere check boxes on the way to standing up a new building or a new development. They're really integral lever levers for achieving our biggest and broadest goals um, to which our communities espouse, like healing the housing market and taking action on climate change and promoting equity and equality across communities. Um, and I can't imagine a more um, robust group of panelists to have this conversation. I'm really honored to be joined by front range planning and transportation practitioners who really exemplify this philosophical transition, um, Justin Montgomery, Phil Greenwald, and Chris Haglin. Um, so Justin, who will be kicking off the conversation, joins us from Littleton, where he serves as an AICP certified planner. And prior to joining Littleton, he actually worked across both the public and private sectors, um, focusing on parking policy. We also have Phil Greenwald, um, now with the city of Longmont, but has a long history over two decades of working in transportation and planning um, across the front range, including, oh, three, sorry, three decades. Sorry, Phil, <laughs> um, including positions at Jeffco and Dr. Cog, our host. Um, and then of course we have Chris Hagelin, who is the acting transportation planning manager for the city of Boulder's Department of Transportation Mobility. Chris and I have had um, the great opportunity of working together in the past. Um, and he's actually been with the city for 16 years. So has, has seen a lot and a lot of change and transition in Boulder and um, really excited to have these three really leaders in, in parking planning and policy here on this conversation today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Justin who will kick us off. And I really look forward to a rigorous conversation with these esteemed planners, as well as the, the other folks on this call. Um, Justin, take it away. Thank you, Mallory. All right, so I am a senior planner uh, with Littleton, Colorado. And just to give you um, kind of just an overview, a little to some facts about uh, the city here, we're about 45,000 people um, under 13 square miles. We have a historic uh, downtown district, including a historic main street, um, ample amount of parks and open space, very active population. Uh, walkability is, is, a, is a big feature within our, our community. Um, so we're located in the, the southern portion of the Dr. Cog region, um, and we're actually stretched within three counties, mainly in Arapahoe County, uh, but we're also in Jefferson County and Douglas County as well. Um, there's a lot of unincorporated areas that surround us that have Littleton addresses. So I assume that there's people out there who think they live in the city of Littleton and they don't. We, we talk to them daily. Um, next slide, please. So um, what we've been doing, what, what the city's been doing, recent plans and code adoptions, there was a big effort in 2019 uh, for Envision Littleton. That's the 2040 um, vision for our city. Uh, that includes a comprehensive plan and a transportation master plan. Um, parking is definitely within both of those plans with highlights to discuss them even further um, in certain areas, especially in downtown, um, where people do feel that there is a parking crunch. Um, what, the, what the Envision Littleton established were a number of character areas for our future land use and character within the city. And these character areas range in intensity, 
and uh, design going from rural residential uh, character feel to corridor mixed use urban settings. Um, so these also include audio auto oriented um, areas where where we feel surface parking is is more appropriate and expected, uh, but then other areas where it's discouraged. And that feeds into the 2021 um, Unified Land Use Code that was adopted. Um, it's our zoning and subdivision regulations. And uh, the bulk of this presentation, of, of my presentation, will focus on what then the ULUC has established for parking standards. Uh, so just a highlight of the parking standards here. So we do have minimum and maximum ratios. We still haven't haven't shed the minimum requirements for our suburban town, uh, but uh, maybe one day. But we do have maximum ratios established. Um, we also use a net floor area to calculate um, parking requirements as opposed to the gross floor area. Um, there's contextual reductions based upon location to the downtown area or also um, location to transit, bus stops, or, or um, light rail stations. Uh, we have shared parking incentives and adaptive reuse incentives that um, would allow a, a property to not have to expand the, the current parking on a site. So a little bit about the off-street parking maximums, which is kind of exciting. So we kind of set like this window of parking. So there's the minimum requirements that we all are, are familiar with. Uh, but also a maximum, and some sometimes it's pretty small, but the 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 area between, and so we're kind of we're we're seeing um, you know how this works in practice and what we need to kind of adjust. The they're based upon the land uses. All land uses have a certain maximum, and the the parking ratios are calculated based upon either the number of dwelling units or or the the floor area, like I was discussing with the net floor area. Um, so the net floor area actually reduces uh, the, the required parking by a, a good amount because it allows, um, allows us to not calculate all the, the gross floor area that encompasses a, a land use and really focus on what's being utilized by hopefully the patrons of the facility. Um, there's also a maximum number of off-street surface parking spaces in our downtown area. Um, as like an overall, no matter what the land use is, it's no more than 125% of the minimum. Um, in practice, this code has been around since October of 2021, and the only um, land use that we've actually had butt up against the maximum has been a quick trip um, convenience store gas station who does not view themselves as a fueling station and wanted wanted to be viewed a little bit more as like a restaurant for part of their area. So it's a little interesting. That's the only one we've really seen so far but up against this maximum ratio. Uh, next slide, please. So we also have a bunch of potential parking reductions within the ULUC. Um, these are for uh, you know shared parking considerations because there's a lot of mixed use potential uh, within our city. Also uh, downtown parking credits and reductions that go up to 50% of, of the requirements. Um, and then also, as I was mentioning, the proximity to the RTD bus stops or light rail station can also reduce a project and the adaptive reuse um, plan, which is utilizing uh, former uses that have, have gone vacant and trying to, you know, re get redevelopment in there and not have parking get in the way of that redevelopment effort. Um, one thing I did not include on this slide, but I should mention is we, the city also adopted an inclusionary housing ordinance. And a part of our incentives within the inclusionary housing ordinance, um, it's depending upon how many a percentage of the affordable units you can provide, uh, parking can also get reduced in, in those situations as well. And that's what I have to share today. Thank you, Tristan. Thanks, Justin. Um, I think we're gonna turn it over to Phil Greenwald. Great. Thank you so much, Mallory. And thanks, Justin. That was great. Um, and it kind of goes back to a lot of the things we tried in Longmont as well. My name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. I should say that I'm a recovering uh, Dr. Cog employee. So um, I have been at, I started my career in Dr. Cog in the early 90s, um, which actually looking back is, was a great, was a great uh, place to start, start my career. So um, 
it's it's been a while, but that explains the gray hair and uh, the glasses and everything. So, um, but uh, we've been doing this for a while. I just really wanted to start off by um, kind of telling the story of what happened in Longmont as far as what happened as far as changing our parking practices and our parking standards as well. Um, um, I just want to talk more about how it started and where we're at now and uh, where we think we're going. I also just did want to talk, to, I didn't put much about where Longmont is in this, but I think you have a general sense that Longmont is one of the more northernmost communities in the Dr. Cog region. Uh, we're a city that just passed 100,000 uh, in population last year. Um, it's a pretty well contained city, so it's got lots of open space and uh, other um, things that kind of keep it from, from growing too far out. So now we're starting to look at growing in. And so that's been a lot of what we've had to look at as well. But I really say that the reason why we started looking at the parking standards changing in Longmont was um, kind of based on this 2005 book tour that John, Donald Shoup did for his uh, new book that was called The High Cost of Free Parking. And it was really interesting to kind of see and read this book. And, and um, you know, in reading it, it was interesting to kind of pull out some of those, those vignettes that he had about um, parking. and I got the chance to meet him as well. And I should say that, you know, Ben Ortiz was the person who was really gonna do this uh, a presentation initially. And he uh, was actually uh, had the chance to go to school and be in a class with Donald Shoup in, at UCLA. So pretty exciting that uh, Ben got to do that. And it's been really great working with Ben and figuring out um, all these different parking issues. He having gone to, you know, actually taken a class from Donald Shoup. So, that's been good. But when Donald Shoup did do his book tour, he really kind of came out and said uh, a lot of great things about why parking minimums were bad. But I really got the sense that he was kind of blaming the cities for, for, for a lot of that. Like, um, you know, you're making, you're making these, these places do this, or you're making these companies build a lot of parking in, in relation to their, what they're trying to build as far as a business or a building. And so um, for the next slide, just to kind of show you the, the idea that, you know, commercial parking was always the, um, you know, was, was always kind of meeting our minimum standards, sure enough, but they're always building more, it always seemed like. So there's always these seas of parking around these, you know, different uh, commercial uses. And multifamily was a little different um, because they really had a, a kind of a more, view of kind of providing just what they needed in, in our minds anyway, that is what we thought. So a lot of what we saw out there was um, the idea that uh, they were just providing exactly what they needed. Um, and, and so we, we kind of went through that when we were going through our parking standards, but also the idea that parking is a land use in itself. Uh, a lot of this land is taking up space that could be used for other things, but we're, we're using it to store vehicles in a very temporary basis. So next slide, please. So we decided to change the, the, the way we looked at parking and really let it be a more of a market-based approach. And so let the developers decide and determine what their parking need is and not let this, not make the city kind of be responsible for you need to provide X number per square footage and anything you go above that is fine. What we really wanted to say was, you guys provide the number of parking spaces you think you need, and um, we'll set a maximum top to that, but don't exceed that. Um, and it was really interesting because because we did not have, we, 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 we did some things, and I'll talk about that later, but uh, we, we did some things with minimums, so uh, kind of strange, but we really did want to decrease the space that's dedicated to, you know, again, that temporary vehicle storage of, you know, how long is that vehicle really there and what, how much need is there and really try to increase the amount of space for people. So shrink that footprint a little bit. Next slide, please. So in 2014, we did change our code amendments. Uh, it was interesting because uh, we kind of took the big step of not having any minimum requirements for commercial developments and place, place only maximums on parking. So you could say, so if a target comes in, they could only provide one space. Uh, you know, uh, technically that's true, but again, we were letting the market decide a lot of that. So we knew that um, when these businesses came in, they needed a certain amount of parking to really 
make their business model work. And uh, so again, we just set a cap on all on all commercial. At the point where we did that, we did, did decide to, uh, we knew people were gonna wanna go over that maximum. So we had written in the code already, these minor modifications that allowed a 25% um, increase over, the, over a numeric value. So technically you could hit that maximum. And uh, if you wanted to go over, we could get you a minor modification, which was very administrative within that 25%. But if you went over that 25%, you're gonna have to go to our planning and zoning commission and they would have to make the decision. So that was kind of the threat we used to make sure that people weren't going too far over the maximums. And now we have an alternative parking plan that's required for any increase over 20% of that maximum standard. So anytime you go, um, if you go 20% over the maximum, um, we'll, we'll allow it. But if you wanna go above that, you have to do an alternative parking plan, really making your case. And even for the 20%, you may have to make your case for why you need the 20%. Um, but you need to make a formal case of, of, of that, but it's still all administrative at this point. So next slide. And I just wanted to provide some real world examples of what's been going on in Longmont. So um, these are all, these, these two businesses that we're gonna talk about are along Main Street. They're also both um, fast food restaurants with drive-through. And so the first one is this McDonald's restaurant. It was, it was uh, built in 1980 under the, Old, I would say the old parking standards. Uh, you can kind of see what the total land area is there, 52,000 52, square feet um, that they needed for the parking, for the building and all those different things. That's not the big deal though. The parking required was anything, it was over you know, 10 or over really equal or greater than 10 spaces per thousand square feet or KSF as we call it too. And this one did provide um, just over that. So 10.4 spaces per KSF. And you can kind of see how that looks on an aerial photography here with our aerial photo to, next to uh, Main Street here. If you go to the next slide, we'll look at a different restaurant that uh, um, came in after the code. So this one was built in 2018. It's a Popeye's restaurant on uh, Main Street, kind of on the north end of town. And this was built under the new parking regulations. And you can see that both both sites had parking adjacent to it as well. So it's it's kind of the sea of parking already. But what Popeyes did was they took a portion of a parking lot that belonged to a bank to the south, um, and it was a pad it was a pad site, but it was parking. They took that and they wanted to build a restaurant, and so we said, um, you know, go go for it. Um, our parking requirements have a max and no minimum, so they were able to go in and um, uh, basically build this. And our parking requirement was, hey, you can't build any more than 10 spaces per thousand square feet. And you can see that that wasn't even probably possible on the site without a lot of consternation. So they were able to do it at 3.2 spaces per thousand square feet. So, um, you know, a third of what we saw at the McDonald's site. So uh, next slide, please. So the city is now undertaking a look at the, um, multifamily piece of this. We're moving out of the commercial piece and trying to go into multifamily, seeing that there's uh, some issues there. And what really pushed this was a study that was done for the city of Longmont by a graduate student, Jeffrey Weathers. And uh, he did a lot of research for us, a lot of uh, work out in the field. And uh, you can kind of see on the right side where he found the gap of kind of what is, um, what what's provided versus what or what? How many spaces they provided for each of these apartment buildings, uh, spread out throughout Longmont, and then how much actual utilization there is. So this was, you know, these these studies were done in the in the late evening, when we thought we had the most uh, people at these apartments, uh, probably parked, you know, overnight, and so it was really eye opening to us. But it didn't really follow what's out there as far as parking generation goes. So it's. It's, it's out there in studies already, but it was good to confirm for the city of Longmont, and I think this is pretty much region and probably North America wide, is that we're really um, providing way too much parking for our multifamily as well. So uh, it suggested uh, changing the rates by 25%, especially near transit services. And in the next slide, you'll see kind of what our outcomes were from that. So outcome number two for our parking code was uh, in 2022, just, uh, just a few months ago, really. Um, 
we changed it so that the, the minimum parking requirements for multifamily in certain zoning districts that are close to our downtown and on, on our um, arterial corridors, that they were uh, replaced with parking maximum. So that we did, we did just flip it. So the minimum becomes the maximum for those apartments that are near transit and services and things that uh, really provide like a walkable, more walkable neighborhood. Uh, we're still concerned though with those parking amounts further away from services. Um, so uh, we've been a little tentative on that. We have unbundled our parking, so we don't bundle the parking altogether. And you'll hear more of that from Chris uh, Haglin uh, from the city of Boulder in, in, his, in his presentation, but we're waiting to see the results. So thank you very much for your time and uh, can't wait to hear the questions that y'all have. So thank you. Um, oh, thanks, Phil. Just some housekeeping. We do have a Q&A section um, along the, the Zoom toolbar. So if you have questions, we will have plenty of time to answer those at the end um, after the moderated conversation. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris Haglin. All right. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, Chris Haglin, uh, now principal planner with the city of Boulder. We did hire a new um, Transportation Planning Manager Valerie Watson. Uh, so I'm back to my old job, which I which I love, which is managing the Transportation Demand Management Program uh, and also the Metrics Program. So all our data collection and survey analysis uh, at the City of Boulder. Um, next slide, please. So I think many people uh, have the impression that you know Boulder is a very progressive place in terms of transportation planning, but uh, currently right now, we still have parking minimums. Uh, prior to COVID, we were in the midst of a three-year effort to uh, change our parking code. We were going to switch to uh, a maximum and minimum uh, standard. Sometimes that minimum could have been zero. So, you know, effectively no parking. Um, but COVID really got in the way of that. And uh, due to some staffing issues, we haven't uh, restarted that, but we're hoping to restart that in uh, 2024 to, to get our parking code update uh, back on track, uh, which is also paired with uh, a potential new uh, transportation demand management or TDM ordinance uh, on new development. Um, but although we do still have an antiquated uh, parking code right now with, with parking minimums, uh, we have implemented some innovative uh, parking management strategies uh, in some of our districts, uh, especially Boulder Junction, which is our uh, transit-oriented development uh, at uh, kind of the 30th and Pearl area. Um, overall, in the city of Boulder, I would say, you know, uh, our work around parking management is guided by uh, a philosophy which has uh, four primary principles. When we look at parking, we look at the sump, we call them the sump principles. Uh, we tried different combinations of letters, but ended up going with sump. Um, and that is shared, unbundled, managed, and paid. And it is our goal to the maximum extent possible to employ these uh, principles. So shared, you know, looking at building less parking because different uses share the parking over different time periods. So you may think of a mixed use development that is both residential and commercial, uh, vehicle storage uh, during the evening for the residents and through the night. Uh, during the day, some of those vehicles leave and then could be used by uh, commercial uh, employees of a commercial development uh, using that. So we want to minimize the number of parking spaces that we uh, that we have by by looking at the the shared uh, uses over time. Unbundled, uh, Phil mentioned this. Um, I believe this is a very effective strategy, especially on the residential side. Um, we should no longer penalize people who do not have a vehicle by effectively having them pay for a vehicle spot uh, at an apartment complex, for example. So uh, in the city of Boulder, we are looking at making sure that 
for all new developments that, especially the residential side, that parking is unbundled. So uh, you pay for your least uh, square footage of your apartment. And then if you wish to have a parking spot, then you pay an extra amount on a monthly basis. And we generally ask that those are at market rates, which currently at the city of Boulder kind of vary from about 75 to $125 per month for an unbundled parking spot. Manage really, you know, we're looking at management of parking in our uh, in our districts. Uh, by this, we mean enforcement. Looking at how we manage parking, uh, it could be time restriction uh, or it could be paid, and and paid is the final uh, principle. Um, where possible, we do not want to provide any free parking. Uh, as was mentioned in in the intro, free parking kind of incentivizes. Uh, single occupant vehicle travel. Um, so those are the kind of the principles that guide our parking management philosophy. We also employ a district approach in the city of Boulder. And so this is uh, most commonly, it is the use of general improvement districts. So these are um, taxing districts that collect property tax uh, from either commercial, residential, or both commercial and residential properties. And then that those dollars that are collected by um, through property taxes are then used uh, to provide funding to manage parking and to provide uh, TDM benefits. And I'll go into a little more detail into uh, kind of what we're doing, uh, especially in Boulder Junction is, which is kind of where we've kind of piled on all our parking management and TDM practices uh, to try to really create a different type of mixed use transit oriented development uh, location. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some of the things that we've done recently, uh, and we've done this for our managed districts, so the districts in which we are uh, collecting the property tax to effectively manage the parking. So this is, again, the downtown University Hill and Boulder Junction. Um, we worked actually with, with Mallory and Walker Consultant to develop a performance-based pricing system. So in areas where we are charging for parking, we have now employed a, a, a performance-based strategy to determine what how or how much that parking should cost. So basically, um, based on the level of demand of certain block faces, you either can raise or lower the price of parking. So a very highly utilized uh, block, those prices would go up and we would change those uh, essentially on an annual basis. Um, we do have a, a, you know, a, a floor level pricing that prices won't go down below, um, but we are really looking at using pricing as a tool to, to manage parking demand. Um, we also have a, a goal of maximizing or increasing the use of our off-street uh, public parking garages. So we've known over time that utilization of the garages is, is lower than we want. Uh, and so we want to drive more people to the off-street parking. And we do this also through creating a price differential between on-street and off-street parking. So it will always be cheaper for you to choose to park in one of our off-street parking garages than parking at, at a convenient spot on-street. Uh, and, and pricing is a great tool uh, to be able to do that. So uh, with this performance-based pricing uh, strategy that, that we've now employed in our districts, um, there's a significant amount of data collection that happens through license plate recognition and through our uh, partnerships with organ with companies like Park Mobile that provide um, the ability to pay for parking through your smartphone. Um, it also requires uh, enforcement to make sure uh, that we uh, take care of violations. Um, we have a strategy now where we're going to investigate the utilization uh, on e on different blocks in our managed districts, and then uh, that will lead to annual pricing changes. So highly utilized blocks will go up in price, uh, essentially. Um, if we do have underutilized blocks, that also provides an opportunity for us to look at curbside management practices and say, 
Well, if if vehicle storage uh, parking is is low on this block face, what what else could we do on this block face uh, to meet some of our new demands? We're seeing a lot of new demands uh, on our curb. Um, you know, it kind of happened during COVID, but also we just see general changes in how commerce is is conducted, uh, especially um, when you look at the the increase of frequency of Amazon, UPS, FedEx deliveries, uh, and also the use of uh, transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft in the evening, demanding uh, more access to the curb. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our curbside management work that's happening right now. Uh, next slide, please. So I think you know one thing that uh, we do in the city of Boulder is we really uh, pair transportation demand management or TDM with with parking management. Uh, TDM is practices uh, are are most effective when paired with parking management, especially paid parking, and and we've seen this over time in our downtown. Uh, downtown Boulder is certainly a unique spot. Uh, paid parking actually started in the 1940s. Uh, uh, on street in downtown Boulder. Uh, and over time, we've been working on how do we change that? And, and most recently, we've we've initiated that performance-based pricing. Uh, one of the unique things that we did in Boulder, uh, and this goes way back to the 90s, is that in addition to the paid parking, we said, uh, we're going to develop a, a new type of transit pass with RTD, uh, which ended up being the Eco Pass. What we do in downtown Boulder, and we have for, for decades, is that we use parking revenue to make sure that everybody who works in downtown Boulder has a free eco pass provided to them. So prior to COVID, we were spending way over a million dollars a year out of the parking revenue uh, to provide uh, up to about 8,000 eco passes. Um, we also made significant multimodal investments for uh, pedestrian and bike access to our downtown. And uh, you know, prior to COVID, we were we were buying up additional bus service from RTD uh, to provide a higher level uh, of multimodal access. Um, what happened is basically we had uh, less than fifty percent of downtown employees using a vehicle uh, to get to work, uh, and in some of our surveys, uh, single occupant vehicle use was down to as low as thirty eight percent before COVID, with with significant. Um, numbers of employees using transit, uh, walking, biking, and also combining bikes and transit. So we saw a lot of that. Based on our experience in downtown Boulder, uh, when we were designing the Transit Village area plan, which later became the Boulder Junction area, uh, as I mentioned at 30, uh, 30th and Pearl area, uh, we said, you know, we want to take all these lessons learned and we want to pile them up in Boulder Junction to really create a new type of place. Uh, so RTD uh, was building a, a new bus station. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be a surface uh, bus station. What we ended up doing is working with RTD to create an underground bus station on top of it, structured parking wrapped in affordable housing. And that really was the start of Boulder Junction. But Boulder Junction, we really wanted it to be this, this, this different type of place, uh, a transit-oriented development, mixed use. It was all kind of light industrial and car dealerships and a lumber yard. Uh, and so we've been transforming that area uh, over the last few years to be this, this different type of place. What we did is we actually created two uh, general improvement districts in Boulder Junction. One is a parking management district and one is a TDM district. Uh, they kind of overlap, but they have a little different boundaries. Uh, both of those collect property taxes from both uh, residential and commercial buildings. And that, that provides ongoing funding. It provides funding that is predictable, reliable, and scalable. When you think about the ability to adjust a mill rate uh, to pro provide more funding if it's needed. And so um, the, the parking district collects those property taxes. We use that to help build um, and finance the structured parking, which is a, a public garage above that RTD station. Uh, we also use that to uh, monitor and enforce uh, parking. 
Uh, Boulder Junction is an area where we created uh, a couple new land, mixed use land uses that do have uh, parking maximums. So th this is the one area of Boulder where we have employed uh, parking maximums. Um, but it's great to have a district provide that funding uh, so that you never have to worry about uh, paying for parking management. But I really think the unique thing and what really makes Boulder Junction a great case study is the second general improvement district, and that is the TDM access district. So again, uh, we collect property taxes from both residential and commercial properties. Uh, and every year we use that revenue uh, and we buy eco passes for everybody who lives or works in Boulder Junction. So we have a combination of a, a business and a neighborhood eco pass program there. Everybody who lives and works also gets an annual bike share membership so they can ride uh, Boulder B-Cycle uh, unlimited rides every year. And we also provide them with a car share membership and credits to car share so that people who are car free have access to a vehicle if they need it. Um, we are now also looking at uh, including some uh, other micro mobility options as we are expanding our uh, e-scooter public e-scooter um, program as well. So uh, hopefully in the future, uh, not only will they have bike share memberships, but they'll also have, uh, you know, X amount of Lime share credits uh, so that they can, they can use the Lime scooters. I also work with uh, Boulder Transportation Connections, which is our local uh, TMO. It's kind of the official Dr. Cog TMO or trans transportation management organization for the city of Boulder. So I contract with Boulder uh, Transportation Connections to essentially manage the program, the day-to-day -day operation. So if someone loses their EcoPass, they contact Boulder Transportation Connections and they get that EcoPass back in the hands of the, of the people. Uh, BTC also works with all the employers and the property management companies that, that manage the residential buildings to make sure that anybody who, uh, a new employee or someone who moves into Boulder Junction gets uh, information, hard copy or electronic of here are the benefits of living in Boulder Junction uh, or working in Boulder Junction. These are the things you get. Um, what we've seen is, is a tremendous uh, shift in travel behavior in Boulder Junction. Um, we're just about done with phase one development, looking at phase two development. Um, but when we look at uh, ITE trip generation rates, uh, and we look at the types of uses, the size of uses, the number of residential units, you know, ITE will say that you would produce X amount of trips. Um, Boulder Junction is producing right now only about 57% of those trips. So a significant reduction uh, in travel behavior or, or single occupant vehicle use uh, in Boulder Junction. So a great success. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, the, I think, the last thing I wanted to uh, discuss is, is uh, we are now in the midst of um, a project to develop a new set of curbside management uh, policies and practices in the city of Boulder. Um, managing the curb is, is it's, it's a growing need, I think, in many of our cities. Um, when you think about the curb and, you know, oftentimes adjacent to that curb is uh, vehicle storage parking, uh, it's one of the largest municipal assets that 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 a city needs to manage. Uh, as I mentioned, there there's increasing demand to access access the curb and new new demands. Uh, we've just seen such an increase in package delivery and then the use of of um, Uber and Lyft. And so we were looking at how do we shift some of our curbside uses away from vehicle storage. Uh, to make um, to accommodate these new new demands, um, commerce is changing. Um, then there's also safety concerns. We see a lot of unsafe practices around people being dropped off from Uber and Lyft, like right in travel lanes. Not only you know blocking traffic, but uh, really a, a safety issue. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, creating some designated uh, places where where Uber and Lyft have to go to drop off people and people who want a ride, hailing a ride, have to go to to get picked up. So uh, we're looking at really a systems approach 
uh, we're not doing a prescriptive block by block. This is how we're going to change the curve. We're really looking at, at, a, at a, a system of block faces and how they function so that we can provide all the different uh, uses um, in, in an area rather than just looking at a specific block face. Um, we're also developing a, um, a series of standard operating procedures uh, that city staff can use uh, when making proactive or reactive changes. So how can we use data that we collect to, to uh, make a proactive change? And I mentioned, you know, if we see a block that is underutilized for parking, that could provide an opportunity uh, to, to have a different curb use uh, on that block face. Uh, but also reactive. Uh, we have a number of businesses that request changes to the curb. So how can we do that um, and have a very standard procedure uh, to assess whether or not a change is warranted? And also, I think working with developers, new development to think about, you know, the city's in charge of public right away and, and what uses are along that curb. But when we have a new development come in, we want to work with them to make sure that the site is functional and it doesn't negatively impact our transportation system. So we can maybe look at some adaptive curbside uses to help that. Uh, we're seeing this, especially with student housing um, and the need for additional flexible loading zones and TNC pickup and drop off. So uh, we've done some pilots. We're looking at developing what we're calling flexible loading zones. So instead of a time restricted loading zone, you know, maybe it's 7 a.m., to 10 a.m., that's a loading zone, and then it uh, converts back into vehicle storage. We're looking at our loading zones becoming 24-7 loading zones. So they could use by, be used by food delivery in the morning. They can be used by UPS, Amazon during the day, and then during the evening, they become designated pickup and drop-off locations for TNCs. Um, we're also looking at uh, parklets and outdoor dining opportunities along our curbside uh, that some of our brick and mortar restaurants uh, are requesting. And then as our sidewalks become more and more crowded with street furniture and other things, uh, there, there may be a need to shift some of our micro mobility parking onto the street and off the sidewalk uh, for our scooter programs and our managed districts and also with B cycle stations uh, as well. Uh, we could be looking at um, changing some of our uh, parking spaces on underutilized blocks into uh, these designated parking areas. So um, hopefully that gives you a kind of a good understanding of kind of the philosophy that, that guides parking management in Boulder and some of the things uh, that we're up to. Uh, and with that, I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so now we do have a couple of guided questions that, um, I especially would love to, to hear some, some feedback from this group of panelists. And then we're already having a, a rigorous conversation in q and I think there are a ton of questions that came through from the audience. Um, quick house, another quick housekeeping note. Um, Dylan, I think the recording will be made available. There were some questions about that. So folks can continue to access this presentation in the future. But um, with that, I'll, I'll move on to, to our questions. And I, th I think that this conversation will address some of the conversation in the Q&A as well. So um, question number one, and um, I, I think I'll, I'll start by addressing this to all three of the panelists. Hello, Mallory. <laughs> I think Mallory froze. Yeah, I think you froze up, Mallory. <laughs> I'll she, take this question. Right. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> Does Dylan have access to the questions? Until Mallory gets back online. Give me one moment to pull them up. Okay. Now it looks like we've completely lost Mallory. <laughs> oh no. You're back. Yes, sorry, I got kicked <laughs> off. <laughs> Good. 
Um, were you able to hear my question or? No, not it, it no. froze right as you started your question. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. All right, so I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, parking can be an incredibly fraught topic. Emotions come into play in a big way when community members hear about changes to their precious parking resources. So in your experience, what strategies work best for gathering feedback and building consensus among community members and decision makers like city councilors? Um, so change can actually happen. And I'll start with Justin. All right. Um, well, I mean, I think it's a good question, honestly, and I'll be taking notes uh, from Chris and Phil on this one as well. I think it, it's very challenging. I think you get polar views of it. You know, you just try to come in. I think just having the ability to have open discussions, uh, making it to where there, there are chances for people to provide their comments and for staff to uh, consider what is being said. Um, we've also um, employed the use of like residential parking permits in areas where there's really a conflict that we see. Um, and, and so that's one strategy to kind of help um, alleviate those, those uh, residents that are close to any areas that have a lot of parking demand. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Phil, did you have anything to add? Well, yeah, I would just say that, you know, throughout my experience anyway, and I'm sure this is true for many, many others, is that parking is such an emotional discussion item. It's such a touch point and such a lightning rod for so many folks. It's very it's very interesting. Um, we just did a parking study for our downtown and it showed that 50% of the parking spaces on a typical, any time during a typical day are not, are not, not being used. Yet we still get the conversation from businesses and people trying to find businesses in our downtown that I can't find parking, parking's impossible. So when we have those conversations about um, changing parking or moving parking or eliminating parking, uh, we really try to balance it with all the different ideas of what benefits you also get with that. And then try to provide that data if we have it available and we try to get it, that's for sure when we have these discussions, um, is, is when we have that kind of data that really shows that it's more of a, what we, we always say in Longmont, it's more of a walking problem than a parking problem. <laughs> so it's just people who are who don't wanna walk the extra half block, full block, whatever it is. I mean, it's not very far, but it's, it's just that perception. And we're just trying to kind of stave that off a little bit with, with data and um, some reasoning about what you get in, in place of parking when we take it. Yeah, thanks, Phil. I think, um... The walking problem, not a parking problem, is something we hear quite frequently. But in so many communities, especially in the Mountain West, you're dealing with the rapidity of change. I mean, a lot of the, these people have seen um, their their communities and downtowns change so quickly, and they used to be able to just pull up right in front of businesses, and and that's now gone by the wayside in so many of our Colorado towns. So, um, Chris, I know you're no stranger to that yeah. <laughs> phenomenon. Did you wanna wanna yeah, add something yeah. on Boulder? Yeah, th this is a huge issue in Boulder um, because we still have the antiquated um, minimum parking. Almost every development, whether it's commercial, residential or mixed use, is asking for a parking reduction. Mm -hmm. As soon as that is heard by the community, there is usually a, a significant emotional response. And I think that's an important thing to remember because oftentimes, it doesn't matter how much data we provide, uh, how much you know, third party traffic analysis is done. People, because it's an emotional reaction, they just don't believe the data. And so it's an emotional reaction. Um, it's very hard to overcome that. And so like, as Justin said, um, a, a tool we use is our what we call our residential or neighborhood parking permit program, but now we're calling it uh, residential access management planning or something like that. So we have a new name for it, but it's the same thing. But basically, you know, what is the city's ability to uh, rather than just reactively, but proactively create a, a, a residential parking permit program? that manages uh, on-street parking in neighborhoods and essentially creates a system in which a, a resident can pretty much be guaranteed that they will be able to park on their block 
uh, if they leave during the day and and need and then return. Uh, and there is a cost to that. It's a very low cost. We are looking at increasing the cost of that. Um, but I think that is, you know, uh, when you can't appeal to people with data, uh, oftentimes then you need to implement something that's going to manage and control it. And so that that that's our residential uh, parking permit program, which just helps uh, prevent overflow into neighborhoods, uh, which essentially cause uh, a livability issue. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that gets to one of the audience questions. And um, I think really indicates and underscores the, the harmony, the necessary harmony between, you know, implementing changes to parking requirements and having a robust parking management program and dedicating city resources to that because you know, managing, we still live in a, an auto centric environment in most places on the front range, that's a reality. So that's something that, that we have to actively manage. Um, so moving on to the next question, uh, we'll get into technology uh, and trends in technology, which regulation so frequently lags. Um, so inv advancements in vehicle and transportation technology happen seemingly every day. Um, you know, with all the new startups in the transportation world, we've seen primarily with transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, um, the increasing permeation of electric vehicles in the market, but many other technologies. And I know that Chris touched on this a little bit in the curb management conversation. Um, it's really hard to regulate with flexibility when tra tech transforms at such a breakneck pace. Um, what strategies and practices do you rely on to create regulations and policies that accommodate change and remain nimble? Um, and we'll start with Justin again. Thanks. Um, you know, this one's challenging for us in Littleton. I, I'm not sure if our, you know, practice with with parking management is quite there to, you know, with the the use of technologies. But we do acknowledge that there are, you know, apps and shared shared parking and or shared ride share uh, programs like Lyft and Uber that you know help reduce the amount of parking that would be needed. Um, but I think this is a, a topic that I do not have much to to add to. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. Phil. I'll move on to you. Yeah, we're kind of in the same boat as Justin. I mean, um, we are certainly looking at new technologies to track parking and also try to manage parking, but we do not do paid parking as of yet. So we're still kind of on the fence for when that should start. We know it should start, but we don't know we don't know when. So we're still kind of working through that issue at this point in time. Uh, a lot of our technology pieces are really geared toward uh, enforcement. And so we're trying to bring on new technologies that really do a better job enforcing our currently timed parking. So we do have people rotating out, kind of back to the Donald Shoup uh, model of, you know, let's have, uh, let's try to keep 15% of the parking open. And, you know, if that's by paid or by, or by enforcement or whatever, let's try to keep some of the parking open so people aren't constantly circling blocks to try to find parking. Uh, we don't want that. So. Uh, that's been a lot of our discussion. We are moving into a transportation mobility planning effort in, in the near future, in the, this summer. And so we are going to relook at all of our parking practices and kind of talk more about the curb management piece of this. But we haven't seen a lot of, um, of the safety issues that I think Chris has talked about with that. So, But we're going to want to look at the curb management piece of this. Um, and, and a lot of that is for not just Uber and Lyft, which we don't have a lot of in Longmont, quite frankly, but it's also for some um, micro mobility or micro transit options that we're looking into, as well as people who just talk about the need to be able to have some curb area to to let off older or 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 patrons with disabilities to be able to access businesses from the front door where people who really do need that front door access and then they can go park their car. Uh, and so we've heard a lot of those issues as well. So those are the things we're kind of working through right now. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, Chris. Yeah, so um, because we, in our three managed districts, we do have paid parking. We have uh, employed a, a few different types of technology to help manage parking. So um, we have on-street kiosks where people can use, you know, a, a credit card, debit card to, um, pay for parking, get a little tag that they can put in into their uh, windshield or else the, their license plate just goes into a database. Um, 
We also use uh, Park Mobile. Park Mobile is just you know one of many companies that provide um, a way for people to pay for parking through their cell, uh, cell phones, smartphones. Um, and then all like once you you know use your phone to say I'm parking in this area, uh, I'm paying this much for this much time. You, you know, at the user, you get a countdown for you know until your your uh, your parking you know safely and uh, you've paid for it. But once it gets down, it starts to alert you, and you can add more time for more money onto it. Uh, Park Mobile does take a fee for that, but all of it uh, through our kiosk and through Park Mobile, everything goes into a database of here are the cars that have uh, paid for parking and are legally parking at the time and. Our parking enforcement officers use license plate recognition as they drive around. Um, they, um, when the when a license plate is picked up, it says you know whether or not that that vehicle is parked legally, or maybe they're out of time or they never paid, uh, and then that enforcement officer can can issue a citation for them. Um, we are also we have five public uh, parking garages in downtown Boulder. And we are moving towards a gateless uh, system. So again, our parking garages, there won't be a gate. There won't be an, an attendant anymore. Uh, it will simply read your license plate uh, as you go into the gate. And to use it, you'll have to, you know, essentially have an account with like uh, with with the system, uh, and then it will automatically charge the the card that you have on file. Uh, from knowing what time you enter the garage and then what time you leave the garage. Um, this technology will also enable us to know how many parking spots are uh, free in the garage. So we can really let people know that, yes, there's capacity in the garage. You can go in and, and pay that. Uh, I think one thing that, you know, we struggle with are the equity issues uh, because all this technology requires smartphones or credit cards. And so, um, you know, in our underbanked communities, uh, communities that, you know, don't have as much access to technology, you know, those are the things we've got to work through to create a more equitable landscape for, for our parking. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. So I think we'll move on to audience questions, just given the fact that it's 11, 12, and we don't have too much time. And there was there are a ton of fascinating um, and, and smart questions in, in the Q&A. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to those. Um, so this, I'm, I'm gonna kind of do these in, in a, a bit of a random order, but um, the, the first, one of the first questions is um, about the land use bill making its way through the state legislation. And I know that Dr. Cog commented on this a bit. Um, and, and I think this is part of a larger trend, right, that we're seeing among states, primarily in the West, um, where state legislatures are, are making a move, but, you know, recognizing the, the relationship between parking requirements and housing affordability and availability and, and making sort of a, a move in aggregate to reduce or in some cases eliminate parking requirements, primarily when it's in close proximity to high frequency transit, like we're seeing out in California. Um, and in Oregon as well. So just just if we could get a general um, a, a feel for uh, from the, the panelists' perspective on you know opportunities and challenges you see in broader state regulation of parking requirements, and then um, how your local government or and, and generally how other local governments should kind of approach um, bringing some local context to those um, state level requirements. I'm going to start with Chris this time. Yeah, sure. Uh, I have not read the full bill. I was just assigned that uh, yesterday from our transportation mobility director uh, and to provide comments by Friday. So, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I kind of understand the the gist of it. And I would say that, you know, it, in my view uh, as a TDM and, and, and parking uh, person, um, that this is all going in an, a right direction. The devil will be in the details, but I really see this as an opportunity to look at um, denser affordable housing opportunities along transit corridors 
and I know from our experience in Boulder, uh, looking at parking utilization that we way over park our multifamily residential um, developments and, and our affordable uh, housing developments. Um, you know, we were looking at uh, requiring less than one parking spot per unit and for affordable housing down to like 0.75 uh, spaces per unit. Um, and I really think what we should be looking at with that bill is combining these parking requirements with TDM benefits. And I'm thinking mostly of the neighborhood eco pass. The neighborhood eco pass um, historically in the city of Boulder is probably the most powerful tool in changing travel behavior. Uh, and if we can unbundle parking, we can incentivize people to be car free, car light, and we provide them with unlimited transit use through a, a program like the Neighborhood Eco Pass, you will see significant changes in behavior. Um, I live in Louisville, I work in Boulder, but you know, I think of a place in Louisville like uh, along US 36 and McCaslin, um, where the Flatiron Flyer stop is. To me, that is the perfect spot to provide dense, affordable housing. You think about someone uh, living there, they have access to a neighborhood eco pass, um, they could live car free and they could work in Boulder, they could work in Denver, they could work in Interlochen. Uh, and uh, by providing them a, a pass like the neighborhood eco pass, that that enables someone uh, to live live car free, car light, uh, and still have all the employment opportunities. So, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I love that, Chris. I think it really covers the the fact that we need to look at both the demand side and, and the the supply side of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, Phil, anything to add there? Yeah, I, I guess I take a little bit different approach, <clears throat> just based on kind of what we've been talking about here and what we've talked about as planners for a long time is it's hard to take like a a template and apply it to every community. So I totally agree with Chris on the idea of of density and and providing more density in cities where there's resources and there's utilities and there's infrastructure available and not try to spread you know these what we see a lot in the north area, especially, is you know a lot of a lot of sprawl. You know, still, it's it's an old term, but it's still very ap applicable to what's going on. And it's single family homes that are just kind of taking up a lot of space and using up a lot of water resources and a lot of other resources to make that happen. So, but I would just say, in agreement with the density piece, I just am going to have a hard time, and I think our city is going to have a hard time with a one size fits all. This is the way you're going to do things, especially in the in the realm of parking. I think you've heard it right here. I mean, this is just three communities in the Denver region, and we all do it very differently. I mean, we're we're kind of close on some things. We do some things similarly, but there's there's enough of a difference, and there's enough of a difference in the different communities that I think we need to make sure we uh, keep some of that local control. It's it's just going to be almost impossible to give some of that up. I believe. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Justin, anything to add? Yeah, just a little bit, you know, uh, really good thoughts there. Um, you know, I think as far as a planner wanting density near where, where transit is located, that makes a lot of sense. We, you know, we, we all know that that makes sense. In some level, having like state regulation helps local governments because there are some things that you can be free from. It's not the the city council's making this decision. It's it's hey, this is the mandate. Now, how can we make it work for our community? So again, like for Phil, like it's not a one size fits all approach, but sometimes it does take these these larger um, regulations to to come and help initiate change in a community that is so emotionally driven by constituents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um. So I think um, just just grouping some of these questions together, there there was a question or kind of a comment about 
the fact that housing and in, in walkable areas, housing in kind of these like new urbanist communities, particularly in um, outside of city centers, um, close to high frequency transit stops, that's often pricey, you know, luxury housing that that's built in those areas, meaning that lots of people can only afford to live in car dependent areas and, and especially in the front range. Um, and I think, you know, when we talk about unbundled parking, that's that's another challenge and a hurdle for folks, um, especially where, you know, that's another cost that, that's being added um, to their bottom line. So how can we kind of balance this concept of paid parking with the fact that, you know, some people are in a situation where they can't necessarily afford to absorb that, that additional cost? Um, maybe a bit about the equity conversation. I'm going to start with Phil. Thanks. I, I think we are really trying to do a lot with uh, affordable and attainable housing in Longmont. And uh, I think a number, number of other, other communities are trying to do the same. So that's been good to see. I think the idea of unbundling the parking so it's not part of the cost helps that as well. And what we've been really trying to talk <clears throat> about the affordable and attainable housing, the, the tie-in is really that transportation cost and trying to remove that as much as possible so you can afford housing, so you can afford food, so you can afford uh, medications and other things that are more hopeful, more, more important, but obviously getting around is extremely important. So we're trying to push things on the transit side at this point because um, we, we really have kind of a limited transit system in Longmont. We do make it um, cost nothing to the user. It's free to the user at this point but we're talking about coverage. And so when we talk about transit rich, um, our transit rich is, is lacking behind a lot of other folks' transit rich levels. So, um, but that's, you know, those, those things and the things that Chris talked about as far as balancing the TDM measures are the things we're really aspiring to, to try to take the burden of cost off of people so they can't afford to live in Longmont, work in Longmont and, uh, and be able to make it work for their, for all different types of, of living uh, scenarios, I guess, is, mm -hmm. is really the best way to put it. We're, we are trying to um, you know, get people to live here and not have a long way to go. And we're trying to get them to think about all the costs associated with living and working in Longmont. And, and always it always comes down to the house costs too much. I need to further, move further out to afford housing. And, and we're trying to get people to look at the full cost you know, the, the, the utilities, the cost of utilities, uh, you know, just more the annual costs uh, associated with living in a town like this, rather than just going out to the east, east side, east of Longmont, where there are a lot of uh, different kinds of districts that the house costs doesn't cost as much, but all the different things uh, add up. So over time. Justin, how how does Littleton approach kind of balancing the the need to manage parking and, and think about more progressive parking policy with um, affordability and equity? Uh, it, it's a good question. I think it's the incentives that we have to you know reduce parking near transit areas. Um, you know, kind of really looking at these these areas near our light rail stations and or bus stops as potential sites along our corridor mixed use areas to to provide that housing. Um, but it's, you know, it's something that I think we're, we're going to need to continue to do. We have a luxury of being closer to Denver. Uh, so as opposed to Longmont, we are on like, you know, the RTD system here to where um, there is there are some more options. But, you know, you know, with, you know, even with that, it's it's challenging. Uh, it, it's hard to say, but, you know, parking and vehicle ownership isn't really a right. Right. It's a luxury. And it's a matter of priorities at some point. And I know it's 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 a very difficult conversation to have. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's not something that everybody, it's not a given that everybody should own a car and have a parking space right in front of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, what can you share? Yeah, so certainly um, affordability in Boulder is a major issue. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very difficult um, issue to solve. Um, but you know what we're seeing is that uh, over time, a larger percentage of our employment base is living outside of Boulder. 
Um, you know, we just did our Boulder Valley and tr transportation survey. Um, we do a survey specifically of municipal employees, so government employees, you know, people like myself, uh, fire, police. Um, only 18% of city municipal uh, employees for Boulder live in Boulder. Um, we've also seen that they live every year further and further away. Um, and people do this, of course, you know, for the affordability of the house, but I, I think there's a lot of education around uh, housing plus transportation costs, or, you know, we commonly refer to as H plus T. Uh, and when you combine, you, you may save money on your housing, but, you know, with gas prices the way they are, are you really saving any money uh, living so far outside uh, and having to drive in? Um, it's also when you look at our greenhouse gas inventory, uh, we know that uh, people who work in Boulder but do not live in Boulder, they drive more in a vehicle one way for a work trip than the average Boulder citizen drives all day for all trips. So if greenhouse gas emissions are important to you and reducing them is important to you. Um, getting people to live closer to where they work uh, is, is a important uh, way to reduce those emissions. And to do that, you have to combine the ability to have affordable housing with programs, TDM programs that provide ways to also reduce transportation costs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the model that that we're working with. But it is difficult. Oftentimes to get affordable housing, um, you know, you have to pair it with with market rate to help, you know, cover the cost. But we're also running into trouble with uh, federally subsidized affordable housing and the antiquated parking rules that they have. Um, where we're not allowed to unbundle parking. And I think there is um, a bit of confusion with unbundled parking. I think a lot of people see the parking cost as an additional expense, but, mm -hmm. but really what it is, is something that you would have already been paying for, but it's just been separated out. And if you don't use it, you're saving money. But I think a lot of that is lost on people. They're saying, oh, you're charging me extra to park, but ideally unbundled parking isn't raising the rate. It is giving the opportunity to lower the rate. And I, I just think there's some confusion around that, uh, you know, amongst amongst the general public. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point, Chris. We've actually done some research that indicates that um, on not bundling or over, oversupplied parking in, in a residential context can add between 15 and 20 percent to the monthly housing costs that an end user pays. So that's that's quite substantial. And um, even in environments like Denver, you know, you the city of Denver, you have developers that do not build on a particular property because they cannot meet the the, the parking requirements. So um, in some cases that it these requirements completely prevent housing from from being built to begin with. So um, quick, like kind of lightning round on some parking management questions from the audience. And then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, well, I'll, I'll say maybe limit your answer to one, one sentence. Gotta, gotta cover it quick. Um, to what extent is using wayfinding for parking important for alleviating visitor concerns about parking? I'll start with Phil. It's just, it's extremely important. <laughs> we're doing we're, we're doing it now uh we're trying to get people into the parking garages new parking garages that were built so we need to show them where the parking is love it very succinct phil um chris same thing um wayfinding to our garages so people don't circle around blocks mm -hmm. looking for an on-street spot it's more emissions it's more traffic congestion uh we need better wayfinding to direct people directly to garages. And I think there's a technological solution with, you know, working with like Google Maps in ways that instead of directing them to your destination, direct them to the nearest parking near your destination. Justin. Agreed. 
<laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, and, and final question here, any great suggestions for working with a senior age population on parking issues? So how do you get the, the senior citizens who maybe don't have ADA placards down with the park, park farther, live longer, park mm -hmm. once uh, philosophy, Chris? So one thing that um, we are working on is creating an on-demand micro paratransit service. So uh, much like an Uber and Lyft paratransit where someone can call up a ride, you know, our system is very antiquated now. You have to call 24 hours in advance. And so I think having an on-demand micro paratransit would enable more seniors um, to live car free, not have those additional expenses, not have those parking needs by really providing great on-demand service. Great. Justin. Uh, agree again. I will just keep it simple. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what what's right. You know, um, yeah. Awesome. Phil. We're working on a similar micro transit model where we're talking about pulling up, getting a ride uh, within 15 minutes of your call, then within 15 minutes of a pickup near your near your location, near a especially if it was a senior living facility, 15 minutes from there anywhere in the city. And so that's without having to own a private vehicle. So that's our mission and our goal for the new TMP. Awesome. Well, fantastic. This was a wonderful conversation. We will make this um, this uh, recording available. And, and I did um, make a record of all of these, these questions, some of which are directed to individual panelists. So we'll, we'll reach out directly and follow up with the audience. Dylan, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you all again so much. This was really fun. Thank you, Mallory. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, as Mallory mentioned, the presentation will be made available on drcog.org. Um, if you go into the calendar events page, you'll be able to find this event for this idea exchange, and that's where the recording and slides will be posted. And um, oops, if you have any additional follow-up questions for any of the speakers today, you can also reach out to me at this email address, and I'm happy to try and connect you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.